all for coming. I'm Conrad Coomley. I'm on the board of Boulder Atheists. And I got an opportunity a couple weeks ago to host Leo Igwe, Dr. Leo Igwe. Am I pronouncing that right? Mm -hmm. um, he gave a talk at the Secular Hub Saturday, or another one in the library in Denver um, yesterday. Um, so, anyways, I'm Kim and I are hosting at our house for three days, and um, but if you, I would use that opportunity for him to give a talk up here in Longmont, so that's what he's doing. All right, today's talk is about a topic that I didn't even know existed two weeks ago, on witch hunting in Africa. Um, Leo Igwe is a board member of the Humanist Association of Nigeria and Humanist International. Um, he holds a master's in philosophy and a doctoral degree in religious studies from the University of Beirut in Germany, and um, wrote his doctoral thesis on witchcraft accusations in northern Ghana. Um, he directs the advocacy for alleged witches and critical thinking social empowerment foundation. Um, and rather than talk more about witchcraft, I'm going to turn it over to you, Leo, and learn more, more, more about it than I do. All right, with that, we I will turn it over to you. All right. and thank you for being here. All right, thank you so much, Conrad, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, Paul and Fies, for this opportunity to interact with you. I think beyond uh, making this presentation, this is my first time coming to this place. And uh, the world is so huge, so, I take this seriously that I, you know, I'm privileged to be here. I'm not going to be in many places before I die. So the, the places I be, you know, I have opportunity of, you know, being there and interacting with people. Uh, I value that a lot. So thank you for bringing me here. Um, the title of my presentation is uh, I call it Information Theory of Change and witch hunting in Africa. Um, information, this, this is an effort to come up with a working tool. What are, what's the mechanism we are using to address this problem? And as you can see on the slide there, uh, this was in fact, they sent us this photo, that was January 1 or 2, at the beginning of the year, this is a woman, she was accused. And the accusation is like when Things happen in the community, you know, some people think that others are responsible. And it's always the women, or more of women, elderly, those who are living alone, and, you know, these are the people that easily get accused. And uh, they, they buried her to the neck, but luckily, but before she could, uh, they could cover her uh, with the sand and all that, the police intervened. Yes. But just like uh, Conrad mentioned, a lot of people don't know what's going on. And uh, I have been, the impression you get if you don't, if you, if you are not from the West, is like white people know everything. So, so yeah, that's the impression, it's prejudice. I'm not saying it's true, I said it's impression. Is it wrong? It's wrong. And that's exactly why I'm doing this. So the notion is that they know everything, so why, what are you going to tell them? So when somebody tells me I don't know, there's still that feeling there. Why don't you know? I thought you know everything. So, but of course it's a wrong impression. So, but that is why we are here. And um, as the title says, the team says, it's also a problem of information. I'm talking about what's going on right there. It's also a problem of information, as we are going to see in this presentation. Now, when the issue of skepticism is mentioned, when you talk about rationality, they don't usually associate that with Africa. It's associated with the West. So when you, when you, are, when you are being skeptical, people think, oh, yeah, yeah, you are, you are being Western, which is not true. It's also another wrong and mistaken assumption. But that's what we have there. But why do we have that there? Because sometimes anthropologists, colonialists, missionaries introduced Africa as we likely know it to the world. Yes. What I mean to the world is that that introduction they made 
they did was a standard, became the standard of how Africa is looked at. So, but the introduction is impaired. There's something wrong with it, as we have said. It's defective because it's stereotypic, it's one sided. And they presented Africa as religious, magical in thinking, and sometimes as primitive. You see that in the literature. So they presented Africans as primitive in our world and interpreted African cultures in ways that created the impression that anything scientific, rationalist, skeptical is Western. That anything magical, religious, uh, occultic is African. So you get this in the literature a lot. So, so this mistaken impression of what I call scholarized racism, which mainly African intellectuals have been reluctant to challenge. Because, you see, I don't want to come here to tell you, oh yeah, the, the West, Western anthropologists misrepresented Africa. What are African intellectuals doing? If you ask me here, now, oh, you are from Nigeria, I said yes. Nigeria is in East Africa. I said no, it's not in East Africa. Is in West Africa. Yes, if somebody misrepresented your culture, it is your duty to correct that. So this, this the, the misrepresentation has persisted because African intellectuals, African students have not been able to challenge these assumptions, challenge these misrepresentations. Now, this the inability to challenge these assumptions has made it difficult for the world to see the other side, the skeptical side, the rationalist side. So that when you are doing the kind of work I'm doing, they will think, oh yeah, you are thinking like white people. You are thinking like Westerners. Yeah, and it's, for me, I find it insulting. Yeah, because I mean, I'm, I'm questioning, I have my own mind, and I don't think that is anything like thinking like people. You question ideas, that's universal. Now, there is no issue where this has, this mistaken representation of Africa and Africans, where it has been very obvious that when it comes to the discussion, the articulation, and the situation of witch hunting. Now, witch hunting means a search for trial and punishment of people who have been accused of witchcraft. L let me also say this. The word witchcraft is English, it's not Africa. It is the word which non-Africans who came to the region used to describe certain phenomena. Conflation, misrepresentation, underrepresentation. This has also been part of the problem at the conceptual level. How do you frame it? For instance, traditional religion, they say it's witchcraft. Somebody writes a, writes a, a, a book on African traditional religion. Sometimes they will change the name to witchcraft. I saw a book like that. I said, what does that mean? So it's just like when you write, okay, uh, 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 after writing a book on Christianity, you now change it to witchcraft. Okay, instead of Christian religion, you say Christian witchcraft. So there's a whole lot of misrepresentation, and that's exactly part of the problem. But the fact remains: are there, or, or the question is, are there uh, um, persecution, punishment of people who are ascribed or who are accused of um, harming others through magical means, through occult means, however you want to say it? The answer is yes. Now, I want, I want you to have a look at this. This is a woman. She was set up less in, in Nigeria. What was the allegation? Some people, had, some people were involved in an accident, and uh, from there they went to a place, a shrine, a diviner. There are so many names you can use to, you can, you can, the way you can describe this place. But what is it? These are places where people go if they suspect that something is spiritual or spiritually cursed, then what they do is that they go there to confirm or get some kind of uh, approval before going ahead with any action. So that's what happened to this woman. That was all. They just came, abducted her from her house, and set her place. Yes, this thing is going on. The, the fact there is that it is going on. We also have another case of another woman from, from, from um, another part of Nigeria. She was also accused, and um, and they came, they also abducted her, they killed her, and uh, haunts the body. So you know, in, in also another part, we also have a case of another um, a man. This one is involved, involves a man. The man, um, this uh, young guy, 
say to the father, oh, my, my grandfather wants to initiate me into the witchcraft world. Because sometimes some children may be induced after interacting with their grandfather, and if, they, if, they, if the father is suspicious, they might start asking them questions. And sometimes they might lead that to witchcraft. And from there, the man was attacked and was killed. And they, after killing, after murdering the man, they pants the body. So we have so many of these cases. Like in, in this very case now, this young girl was accused. So they brought, they brought her out in the night. So they set this fire. And they were just pushing her to the fire to compel, trying to tell her, OK, you have to accept that you are the one responsible. You are the one uh, who did this. So they were pushing her close to the fire. And it got to the point that part of the body got burned that down she had beaten. Now, sometimes without situating the circumstances under which these people admit, what they do, oh yeah, did you see some people start spreading the idea that, oh yeah, somebody had it. They admit under torture, you know, when they have no other choice but to admit in order to save their lives. So that was what was happened in that case. So we have so many other, other, other cases whereby uh, people who are accused of either being responsible for the thunderstorm or being responsible for accidents, we are accusing some of these rural communities. That's where they take place. And they are tortured, killed, or some, occasionally they get rescued. So now, in the course of doing all this, I, was, I had opportunity of going to do my doctorate degree in Germany and did an academic study of this phenomenon. I did my field work in Ghana, and in the, north of, in the northern part of Ghana, they have what they call witch camps. These are not witch camps. They call these places witch camps English. These are shrines, these are places where if you are accused, people run to those places so that they are not killed. Now, in the course of trying to put that in English, they call that witch camps. By so doing, reinforcing the notion that the people who go there are witches, as the case may be. So that was where I did my field work. And when I came back, I was so unsatisfied with how the witch hunting phenomenon is misrepresented by scholars and by how the campaigners are also very reluctant in confronting the issue. For instance, you work with Western NGOs, they will tell you, please, don't call witchcraft superstition. And I was asking one of them, if you don't call it superstition, what do you call it? So somehow, they will be selling the idea that witchcraft for Africans is a kind of science, and it's African science. And you see that. So you get that kind of notion. So even the, even the campaigner, those who are trying to address the problem, are reluctant. They will tell you, oh, it is cultural. And you know, we have to be very careful. Let's highlight the abuses. So on the theoretical side, the whole thing is misframed. And nobody is ready to challenge that the misrepresentation. On the practical activist side, a lot of people are just preparing over the problem. I saw an NGO, they are, what they were doing in the so-called witch camp is just to go and send, the, send them clothes to those places, then help repair their hearts and all that. And after that, they take, they take pictures with them. Oh, we are working in the witch camps. And they send the report to their Western NGOs who, in exchange for money. With that, the problem will continue. They, they're just, you know, they're just a kind of addressing it in a way that wait, it's not going to stop. Those places should be shut down. And people who are there should go back home. And those who send them away should be in jail. Period. They should be punished. But this is not being done. So I was so unsatisfied with how things were going on. And I felt that the best way to spend my life is not going back to the classroom and teaching students and sending them back to those witch camps again to keep researching and keep writing and keep repeating ourselves. Because if you read all the writing, you, see, you just ask yourself, why, 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 why are people, why are people, editors approving this, some of these articles? They keep re repeating themselves and keep saying the same thing, all in the name of academic journal articles. So I wasn't happy with that. I also wasn't happy with the uh, NGOs who were also just interested in getting the funds, justifying the spending of the of funds, and that's it. They are not ready to tackle the problem head on. So that was why in 2020, I started the what I call the advocacy for alleged 
which is, I made it that way because most of the NGOs will say, okay, this one is Action Aid, this one is uh, Human Rights Organization. So they, 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 they don't want to come out clearly in terms of what they stand for because they feel that when they come out clearly, there will be stigma and all that. I say, no, it's like, as if they are not, they are not sure. You know what they are, what they really want to address. So I started the advocacy uh, against uh, uh, witch persecution, and uh, and I, I outlined a vision to make witch hunting history by 20, uh, 2030. When I announced it, people were laughing at me. You know, it's like if I be a BBC journalist reached out to me and said, "Where will you get the money?" You know, if I one of the if I <laughs> one of the guys who are you know involved in the addressing the problem. I think when I publish it somewhere, he don't use this laughing e e emoji. You know, that's what the person used to respond to it. You know, as if, you know, this problem is all going away and all that. But we really need to set dates, measure our efforts, know where we are. You know, each year we keep reviewing ourselves, what are we doing? You know, we are not here to paper over problem, raise funds, share amongst ourselves, etc. This problem should get away so that we can face other issues in the region. So that's why I felt that there's a need for us to have some kind of a timeline and all that, so that we can measure our efforts and initiatives. But we've been making progress because we've been trying to, you know, work with other organizations, bring our approach, you know, on, on, on board and try to network with, uh, with groups. Let's say here in the United <coughs> States, there is one uh, group, and which hunts, you know, is a, um, is a, some uh, there are some people here who are trying to campaign for the exoneration of their relatives or who we are convicted. And that was in the 17th century. I think if I'm wrong, you correct me. Yeah, so, and we've been trying to work with them so that they can also bring the contemporary uh, cases we are handling in order to address these issues. So now, it, what, what are some of our findings? Of course, most of those who are accused are women. Just as, as I, 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 I showed, you know, at the beginning of the presentation, um, like this, this, this woman, in a, 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 her case, you know, very pathetic, because the only son died in a motor accident, and the people in the community accused her that she was responsible for the death of her only son, and they beat her terribly that she could not even walk. She was taken to a hospital. So. Women are often the people who are targeted. And uh, we also have cases, like I said, children, they are also targeted. Sometimes these are children not staying, living with their parents, they are living with relatives, they are likely to be targeted. Or children who are born with uh, disabilities. Sometimes when parents cannot manage with such disabilities, they spiritualize it. So there are so many cases, we have so many cases where children are thrown out or, or they are beaten up or abused in so many ways because they are, the parents are suspecting that they have the link with the supernatural. Sometimes children are, children are compelled to confess and indict adults. Like in Malawi, children will say, oh, that the grandmother or grandfather wants to initiate, initiate them and into the witchcraft world. Sometimes they, they tell them that they took them in a witchcraft play. Yes, they even have a notion of witchcraft play. And uh, I tried to tell the, our colleagues in Malawi to send us, send me the photo of a witchcraft play. And uh, the witchcraft play in Malawi you all, is always on the floor. You, you never see it fly. You know? so, so that is it. So some of these things are things that local charlatans, priests, they use it to sustain the narrative that people can actually harm others through, um, um, through supernatural means. So why did we adopt what I call the inform information theory? We adopted it because we found out that there's a need to respond at the level of information and at the level of action, take practical steps to address this problem. So we, um, at, at, the, at, the, at the advocacy for language, which is, we use this information theory because witch hunting persists in the region due to lack of information, due to misinformation, and due to lack of action or inaction or infraction. So we discovered this. Either that the people lack the information, or they could not act 
So what we do is that we try to inform and also we try to compel people to take action. Because with these two pillars, with these two approaches, we think that witch hunting will end in the region. And we were able to overwhelm the witch hunters. So at a global level, like, like I noted earlier, there is a lack of information about witch hunting in the region. I keep going, even, even the, um, the person who hosted me, uh, both in uh, Santa Barbara and even in Denver, she was, they, they were all telling me that, I didn't know that this is going on. I didn't know that this is going on. And, I'm, and I kept wondering, why? Why don't they know? So we, part of our goal is to inform the world that this is going on, to inform the world that in Zambia, there are many people alive after accusing them. Yes, human beings, they're burying them alive. In Nigeria, the same thing. There are certain people are blamed. They are clubbing people to death. Just, just based on mere accusation and nothing more. Now, the scholars will say, oh, there's a result of envy. There's a result of property. Now, if you, for instance, I'm, oh, I'm envious. I attack somebody and kill the person. What's the next thing? Put the person in jail. That's the next thing. But now they say, oh, no, no, no. You know, which, which kind of accusation has some benefits for Africans? Rubbish. It's helping Africans stabilize their society. Nonsense. They will tell you, oh, it's a mechanism Africans are using to make sense of modernity. That modernity has disrupted the way Africans are living, and this disruption is making Africa. I mean, you see scholars coming up with explanation that legitimizes. They may not say it. If I ask them, they will not agree. But well, read those, uh, uh, those articles. They tend to legitimize, tacitly legitimize, which hunting you know, in Africa. And they will tell you, oh, in the West, it was a wild phenomenon. And that was why it went away. But in Africa, it's, it's useful. That's why it persists. OK? So now, is it useful for this woman? Yes. Is it useful for, 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 for this girl and the family? Is it useful? For this, for this woman and the family. So from, where, from, from, from which perspective is it useful? Yes. So, so there is that misrepresentation, and there is that misinformation of the world, and part of the thing we are doing is to see how we can get the world to understand this. Again, a part of that misinformation is also getting the world to understand that witch hunting may not also have ended completely. I'm coming. Exorcism in Africa is a form of witch hunt. And exorcism is something you see going on in Christian communities. And if we look closely, let's say in the US and other places, we we'll see practices linked to exorcism or abuses linked to exorcism. Not only that, we also have to keep track of what goes on in the migrant communities because witch hunting, witch blood beliefs are very intense, let's say in many parts of Africa and Asia. And many people from these regions, they come to, they, they, they migrate and they come to live here. So I used to tell some of my colleagues here that this may come back to bite us someday if we continue to say we don't know about it because it may be happening below the radar. You may not be in the position to track this. So that it is important that we keep track of what is going on. For instance, a lot of Africans who live here accuse their relatives who live in Nigeria, who live back home, of witchcraft. They, they accuse them of being responsible for, for, um, for their misfortune or the difficulties they can't. We have cases where some people are here, either they cannot um, conceive, they cannot get pregnant, they will be blaming their, their, their mother or relatives back home. A woman in Ghana told me that in the course of my field work that a daughter who was living here, attending an African church, called her on phone and was like, what is going on? Okay? And we also have other similar cases where people come here, they encounter certain difficulties, they are not able to address them, they make those accusations. So it is important that uh, we understand that there could also be some kind of, or some witch hunting or some accusations of witchcraft going on even in contemporary America. But beyond that, we also have to address it right there. Like I said, many people when they are sick, what, where do you go when you are sick? A lot of people cannot go to hospital because they cannot afford it. It's not because they prefer the witchcraft narrative, but a lot of people cannot afford you know, going to the hospital of course. We don't have free medical care. I don't know whether you have it in the US. You know, 
so but we don't have it there. So you, you, you have to pay your way. So as a result of that, a lot of people want to go to where they could do some ritual and, the, and all the, tell them who is responsible for their problem. And from there, they could uh, uh, maybe abduct this person, torture the person, and get the person, try to compel the person to heal the person who is uh, supposedly bewitched. So medical information is very important. Health information is very important. And I have been writing the WHO, contacting them. I said, look, during the COVID, we have been bombarded with a lot of information. Don't do this. They said they were correcting misinformation and disinformation. Now, why are you not also addressing misinformation and disinformation? Link to witchcraft accusation. No reply, no response. But during the, during that, during the COVID, they were all bombarding us with a lot of information, including areas where people could not even understand what COVID was. And they were just going about their business, living, alive, living their lives normally. So there is this reluctance to really address the problem of misinformation. And we we'll keep calling on WHO and other health agencies to understand that witchcraft accusation is a health issue. And it happens as a result of misinformation by those who make these accusations. And that by addressing that misinformation, we'll be able to make progress. So, so but, um, but, but like we noted, this information, correct information, is not enough. Balanced interpretation of witchcraft accusation does not suffice. To combat which persecution, information needs to be turned into action. Yes. Yes, we, 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 we can tell people, OK, go to hospital. Yes. Or go to the police. But we can also help them. Because a lot of people, I, I met a woman in Ghana. She told me that she didn't even know where the police station was. Yes. Some don't even know the hospital where you want them to go. Some they don't have the means. So it is important to also begin the process of making sure that some of these institutions are very close to the people. I went to so many villages that have no, no, no police station, no health, no health center. I'm not talking about a hospital. So how do you expect people who are living in situations where they don't have this uh, police station? How do, how, 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 what will they do? So they have to fall back on what they, what they have within their communities. So we have to also take some action. And on, on the action side, the advocacy for learning which is, takes measures to address this problem because lack of adequate information has occasioned inaction and infraction. Wrong information has resulted in apathy and indifference towards witch hunting in the region. So a lot of people, you know, when they say, oh yeah, that woman is a witch or, or is responsible for a problem, they don't want to show any kind of compassion. They think that the person deserves torture or being beaten or abused. So we also need not, not only to intervene in those cases, but to keep educating and reorienting the minds of the people. Because I am doing what I'm doing because I know that these people are innocent. And I say it. So if you if I see if I see them being beaten up or people are going to attack them, just like you're attacking an innocent person. So I am moved to intervene. So it is important we make that a social and a collective campaign where people understand that these are innocent people. You shouldn't beat them up. You shouldn't set them ablaze. You shouldn't torture them. You shouldn't club them to death. So until we get that information that can compel people to take this action, this problem continues. Now at the local level, the advocacy for alleged witches works to fill in the information and action gap. Many people accuse or engage in witch hunting due to misinformation. Accusers are misinformed about the cause of illness and death and other misfortune. Now, like now, in many of the rural communities, there are no good roads. People travel in the night. They use their motorbike. They don't use headlights. You are going to have accidents. You are just preparing yourself to accident. Now, if you have an accident, you say, ah, it's witchcraft. Witchcraft where? You are traveling in the night roads. No, no, no road signs, no, you don't have headlights, there's no electricity. Already you are preparing yourself to be killed. They're just swarming you and all that. But what happens is that they will not accept that and all that. So that education, the process, process of educating the people is also very important. Many people persecute witches because they have incorrect information about who or what is responsible for their problems. Yeah, somebody dies, they say, ah, they have killed him. 
You know, when they use that in that third person, you know very well, yeah, they have killed him. Now, we have to find a person. They now go to somebody who has no knowledge of biology, who has no knowledge of uh, you know, anatomy, or any human, human mechanism, and the person will not tell you by looking at uh, stones and calories, the person will not tell you who is, who is responsible for that. No. So this is the, this is the reason. So because, because people are not informed about what to do and where to go, and who to blame for this misfortune, they make accusations. Many people do not know what constitutes sufficient reason, sufficient reason or, ca or causal explanations for their problems. So, because sometimes you even go to the hospital. Many of these hospitals are not very well equipped, and maybe the doctor doesn't have the the necessary technologies to really carry out tests and know exactly what is wrong. So they'll be administering it at a point the doctor will tell you, yeah, this is not a medical thing. Yeah, the doctors will tell you. The nurses sometimes tell you, look, this is no longer a medical thing. You really have to do something about it. And when they're telling you this, they're telling you to go find a uh, diviner or spiritualist or witch doctor. They will start making sacrifices, start making allegations. So sometimes our hospitals or medical officers are also responsible. So as part of the efforts to end witch hunting, we highlight this misinformation disinformation about the causes of misfortune, illness, death, accident, poverty, infertility, as the case may be. Because we are in a trap. I don't know the reason I met Africa that way. So um, I'm sure coming from there, somebody may want me to explain why Africa is poor and problems there. I don't know. I met it that way. But the thing there is that you could see the vicious circle there. Because of lack of um, good medical infrastructure, a lot of people die of um, illnesses that ordinarily they could, you know, they could recover or they could, um, they couldn't have died as a result of that. So a lot of people suffer like that. So, but what happens is that it is important that we deploy common sense explanation and, and framing and situation of these problems and not take a leap into the supernatural because it does not solve the problem. It even causes more problem. When you said people say. Uh, uh, mothers and blaze have been accusing them. No problem and all that. So we are trying to see how we can provide necessary information. If you're infected, you cannot get pregnant, you have to go to the doctor, they will give you all the necessary options on what to do, and you focus on that. Instead of dissipating your energy, looking for a devil, demon, looking for witches, wizard, and all sorts of supernatural agents, the thing could do that. So we provide evidence-based knowledge explanation and interpretation of this culture and inform the public about the law and other existing mechanisms. So if you're accused, we inform you. This is where you should go. Go to the police. Of course it's tough, because when you also go to the police, that's another issue. Because sometimes the police will now tell you you also have to bring money for them to investigate your case. And these are people who are already poor. These are people who are already, you know, they don't have money. Now they go to the police, the police will start asking them for bribe or money to for them to intervene. So they, they prefer resigning to the situation. So what we do is that we try to come in, we try to pressurize the police, and sometimes if they need um, money for, because sometimes they will tell you, oh, the place is interior, our vehicle, we don't have enough fuel, I rather we give them money for fuel. And of course, in on some cases, when you give them money for fuel, they will ask for more money, more money, and all that. So the police situation is also another, another factor. So. So what we do to address this sometimes is what we call the institutional synergy. In other words, trying to combine the police with other agencies, like the chief working with the police, the police working with the courts, the courts working with the NGOs, so that it can help us you know, get a, a, a robust response when it happens. Because sometimes many of these individuals, um, many of the institutions on their own cannot deliver in terms of uh, tackling the problem. So we pressure these agencies to act and collaborate and take appropriate measures to penalize witch hunting um, activities in the region. We intervene to support individual victims. Sometimes, they, because when, you, when they are accused, they banish them from the community. We try to provide them some temporary shelters while we try to, while intervening and trying to see what to do. So like now, there was a man who was accused and um, 
and they beat him up. So what we do, we had to get the relatives to take him to another relative again. They will give them give them money to so take care of the man until the tension comes down, until we're able to reconcile, you know, the people. So the, this intervention is based on the needs and available resources. And in situations where the victims survived or are not killed, we work to we work with the relatives to take them to a safe location, like I just said. Or support their medical treatment because sometimes they are wounded. They will sometimes some of them, when they're set in place, they survive. We have a man who was set in place, and that was last year, and uh, we were able to support the medical bills, and uh, he's okay. He's okay now, and we have to get him to return to the community. So, so in situations where their languages are murdered or were murdered, how far supports the relatives? So, because like this case, the daughter of this um, this woman was also banished from the community after they after they killed the mother. So what we're doing is we try to raise money and get them to either get to school or learn some catering or learn some, some kind of skills that they can use to survive on their own. Because one of the things that um, make, uh, one of the things that make um, people vulnerable is that maybe you don't have uh, income, you don't have a job, you are loitering in the village and things like that. So very often these are people that are easily targeted by witch hunters. So, I will conclude very soon. So, for instance, in the case of this 89-year-old um, man who was set up place for, for witchcraft in Nigeria, we petitioned the police. Because when they reported the matter, the, the, police, were, the police, they were asking for money. So when they, the lady reported to us, we had to petition the police authorities, and they now compelled the junior officers to make arrest, and the matter was charged to court. So, so advocates from from our organization will, you know, eventually accompany some of these people to the communities where we, we follow them to courts, we follow them to the communities, just to make sure that we give them that sense of solidarity. Because whenever they're accused, all these ties, family ties, community ties, are broken. So we try to fill in. So, um, so as expected, our organization we get more cases that we can handle. In Nigeria alone, we keep getting cases even from uh, Seychelles. A politician was accused of uh, Seychelles. It was a politically motivated witchcraft accusation. So we have in Malawi, like I noted, people are suing to death, people are beating. And in fact, as that today, I got a message from Malawi that somebody who prophesied that there was a witch in the community, the police arrested the person. And the community now went to the police station trying to pressure the police to release the accuser. So these are some of the things we are encouraging. Whenever the police are doing well, we try to encourage them and all that. And in Malawi, they tend to be responding to some of the pressures we are putting on them um, to make sure that they're responding. Because we cannot do this on our own. The institutions, they have to work to respond to address these issues. So we get more cases, but due to limited resources, we have not been able to intervene in many cases. Like now, we have over a 1,000 people in so-called witch hunting camp. We are doing my I did my research work. And during my research work, there were people who were telling me, please, can you help me go back home? But I couldn't. Yeah. Because I was also worried that you know such a process could actually get me into trouble with families and things like that. But it haunts me as I as I as I, as I sit here. And I, I still find it difficult to see how I could continue my life without doing something at least post-research post-doctoral degree and all that. Go back there and begin the process of, because they can really be taken back home. Yes, it's possible. But the only thing is that there is no political will. They have, they, have taken, they have resigned to it. And now people are now trying to explain how the witch camps are helping in managing that. They are not helping. You, you are more than you drive, they drive your mom down to a makeshift camp. Some of those places are, look like huts with small, small doors and all that, no window. You know, that's really just something very small. Now, somebody is, is explaining it as a scholar how they, which these places are helping in the management. No. So what are we? What am I trying to do? I'm trying to see if we can use this organization to begin to respond to this situation the way it's supposed to be. Let these people go home. People should go back to their homes. I went to. I, I visited a home, magnificent building, but they accused the woman that she was responsible for the death of the daughter. 
And the woman was telling me, say, look, how can I kill my own daughter? How? That when she, this daughter was a baby, I can that, that uh, she took care of the daughter when it was a baby. Now, she didn't kill her when, when she was a baby. Now, it's now, she's grown up and all that. that, that that's when, you know, they are alleging that. And they tortured her to admit that she was responsible. Because there's something they do, um, they, they just use something like a broom and put it on your neck and choke you if you, they say that the court, <coughs> if you are guilty, the, the, the whole thing will separate and loosen up. But if you are not guilty, the whole thing will tighten until you start confessing. I mean, it's rubbish. The man will, will hold it at the, you know, when it comes to the person that suspecting was responsible. Now the woman started confessing, and that was how they banished the woman from the community. So I'm not able to go back, but it still haunts me. Because I know that what, the, what, so, what we're supposed to do there, we're not doing it. The government is peppering over it. The NGOs are just looking at their funders, what they want. And they come, they do it, send them reports, and justify the money sent to the next family year. That's what's going on. So, so what, I, what, I, what I'm saying here is that in less than four years, we, our advocacy group, we have re registered effective presence you know, through our interventions in Nigeria. But much of what we do when it comes to other countries is just press releases, calling the police, calling government agencies, tweeting, targeting the necessary people. In Nigeria, we are going to do real intervention like what I have shown here. Like this woman, this lady with, this woman will intervene in her case. We are taking care of um, uh, supporting the police uh, investigation and all that. So in this case, this woman was also accused, and uh, we were accused by the son. The son, the, 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 the husband is late. So the son wanted to sell the husband's, this is what the woman told me. The son wanted to sell the husband's property, the land and all that. The woman refused, you know. So there was this tension between this woman. So when one of the children was sick and died, the son accused the, the woman of being responsible for that. And they now came, beat her up, chased out of the community and all that. So what we did, we worked with her, we gave we get her some money to restart her business, and she's back in the community. So what we are doing is that with these few cases, we can send the message of stop, don't do it again. We may not be able to intervene in all the cases that are reported to us. Now, we also have this, this case again. Uh, the, the woman lying there is the, the accused person. The person lying on the floor, that's it, the, the accused. Because they beat her, and they said that she was she wanted to kill the community members to witchcraft me. So they brought, you know, what they call masquerade. These are just decorations. These are things you could just do and all that. But they just make it seem as if it's uh, one big thing. So they beat her. So eventually they drove out of, out of the community. We are working. We have gotten her a new apartment. We are working to help, you know, start her so that she could start her business and be able to see what we could do to defend and stand her ground because those things are actually some of the things making a lot of people to be accused. So these are the efforts we are making, not just at the level of information, correcting the misinformation, but also taking some action, all to send a signal and see if we can begin to beat back the tide of accusation and, uh, and witch hunting. And, um, and I know that in the course of doing this, we we'll always appreciate the support of humanists and skeptics here in uh, Boulder, in the US, and other parts of the world, because we can't do this alone. And we really need to do this, otherwise this trend will continue. So I'm looking forward to your support, but particularly for this presentation, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. I'm curious as to what causes a person to accuse another person of witchcraft? Is it just because they didn't like that person? Uh, was there, what is the justification for saying that person is a witch and should be mistreated? Yeah, yes, thank you. That's a very, it's a very good question. The, the thing is, first of all, the causal, should I call it philosophy or narrative, is part of the socialization. As you are being socialized, as you grew up in the community, the very the, the very understand that not everything is practically caused. In other words, if there's an accident that a car hits your house, sometimes it may not be a car. <laughs> okay? So 
already your mind is primed to accuse. So I'm, I'm just saying that. So you already, your mind is already prepared. Now what you now, what you now do is you now go out now, and when there is an incident, you now apply it to it, depending on where, whether you are the receiving end, more especially of the misfortune. So people are socialized now. I grew up in a village and all that, and the the socialization is that ants are not ants. Dogs are not dogs. Cats are not cats. Birds are not birds. Sometimes, <laughs> some dogs are human beings. <laughs> some cats are all. So all this, uh, uh, this is, yeah. So you are already, your mind is already prepared to accuse. Yes. So that is why it, part of what we, are, what we are doing is a critical thinking. I think uh, uh, Conrad mentioned it in the introduction. So part of what I'm doing again is a critical thinking program and trying to get uh, children to question. So by the time they begin to question and the grip of this narrative loses their mind, it weakens. So anything could trigger it and justify it. And what they do is that as soon as it happens, like, like for instance in this community, somebody dies. Suddenly a young person dies. So what they do, they say, ah, this is not ordinary. Because as you, are, as you are growing up, you are meant to understand that there could be ordinary causes for or extraordinary causes. So if you don't have, if you don't subscribe to the ordinary thing, it, you, you pull in the other. So growing up, your mind is already primed, your mind is already predisposed to accuse. And when it, when it happens, you now suspect, when you suspect it, what you do now, you take the suspicion now to the so-called priest, who will now tighten and firm up. Okay. So it's not just like one accusation that way. It's social. It's, there's also some kind of professional. In other words, there's somebody that says, okay, bring all the suspe all the suspects, all the, the suspicious, suspe all the people are suspecting. The person will now do some incantation or ritual and say, okay, it's this person. Very likely, the person that the people are suspecting. It's not like there's anything he does. Anything. Okay, so the justification is a complex thing. It's not just something that goes. It's not like it's not just something that you know happens right away, straightforward. So you get the suspicion. Everybody says, "Hmm, yeah, this something has to be done. Let's go and find out." They pay money to go and find out something that is rubbish. Something, nothing, nothing comes out of it. But they still pay money for it. Now they go there. They will now tell them, "Yes." In fact, I was trying to find out from a divine how they do it. So. One of them told me that when they come, that they have a divining rod for it. So they will ask them who are they suspecting. They will represent them with stones or cowries, as the case may be. So now they will do the incantation and look away. And, and when they do the incantation, they will do it this way, that whoever the, rod, the divining rod hits, the person that is represented by that cowrie or stone becomes so you can see the, the process of justification and well, it's, not, it's not like it doesn't, it's not a straightforward thing. Another one was the one I told you, they used a broom. I went to meet the guy who did it. It was, it was shortly when I was about to start my field work. He told me there was a case. So this woman was accused and they, they brought all the suspects together. Then they used what they call the broom and put on their neck and dragged them on the floor and all that. So I went to see them because I mean, I, I'm not like a true academic, I must tell you. I was very angry. So I went there, but I was like pretending as if I was academic. I wasn't academic. I was very angry, very upset. So I went to see them, the guy. Now, I saw the guy about two, three times. Friends, all the time I saw this guy, he was drunk. I'm talking about the divine, the so-called uh, healer or witch hunter. But he was drunk. And when, that, when I was coming, he told me to bring him a uh, Snap or whiskey. I don't know what you call it here in the US. Yes. He told me to bring that. And when I come, he, he doesn't drink it with cup. He, he, he drinks from the bottle. And when, after drinking, he, he'll be doing his eyes this way. I said, ah, is that how you see spirits or what? <laughs> <laughs> so, so now, you know, those things they make me more angry. I have to let you know. I was really upset that somebody, a reckless, irresponsible guy, you know, will just, based on Something born out of alcohol or drunkenness, you now, um, you kill. 
or you send people away from their houses. And I asked him, I said, what is your, what is your job? He, he, he showed me an ID card. And when they say profession, he said psychic. This guy didn't understand what psychic. I want to tell you. But I'm sure somebody must have told him to put psychic there. Okay? So I don't know what psychic is. I don't know what they do here. I'm sure you guys will explain that to me. So what am I trying to say? Establishment of a justification is a process. Okay? It's not just like a particular thing that is done. So, and that's how it's done. And that's how the whole thing becomes social. And, it, and the society and the community is now mobilized against the so-called person. And they cannot take any action against the person. Yeah. Is this sort of stuff restricted to the villages, or does it happen in the cities as well? Um, you know, it's, it's often in the villages, number one. It's often in the poor neighborhoods, you know, even in the cities. You know, those quality, the areas, you know, where, I don't know what, I don't, what they call it, you know, where poor people live, and they all live together, sometimes they see crowded places, you know. Like I used to tell them in Nigeria, in Nigeria uh, sometimes they said, ah, uh, uh, a bird woman, that's what they call that, a bird flies over a particular place. You now see an elderly woman, maybe. Oh, which? Yes. Oh. A bird yeah. that oh. flies, you know. So they will say, oh, the woman turned to a bird. And if you are not taking it, they will beat the woman to death. So it happens, I used to tell them, why does it happen, you know, um, in those poor jungle, you know, neighborhoods and all that. It also have a VIP area. It doesn't happen in front of the US embassy and all that. You know those places. It doesn't. Posh areas where people live. No. It happens in all those dead tasting, clean, crowded places and all that. So that is that is where the thing is. That's, that's how it, that's the pattern and all that. But what happens is that when in poor neighborhoods or in the rural areas, we have to put in place a mechanism to shut it down, yeah, to stop it. So, yeah. so it, it really sounds to me like it's a, it's your version of conspiracy theory in, in Africa. I mean, we have conspiracy theorists in, here in the U.S., but they don't take to that level. Well, I suppose they, they kind of approach that. Uh, January 6th insurrection was kind of based on that. But um, um, oh, how, so Nigeria is roughly 50-50 Muslim, Christian, something like that. How do those two religions um, interface with this phenomena? Do they do they add to it? Do they subtract from it? Do they take it? Uh, how, do, how does that whole amalgam work or that mixture? Yeah, the, first of all, um, as represented, Nigeria is dominantly Christian and Muslim. Okay? But look, that is fake. Yes. I, I have to say it this way because I live there. Okay? Now, we need to really situate that. Christianity and Islam were introduced by foreigners who, of course, didn't value whatever is Africa, whether it's their belief or their politics and all that. If you can put it clearly, they were introduced by racists. Yes. That is why they tell Africans the person who served them is Jesus. And Jesus doesn't actually look like them. Okay? I don't know what it looks like you guys, but let's, let's leave that one for now. Um, so what happens is that they introduce these religions with a lot of force and violence. So many people you know, embrace their religion, not because they are convinced. I keep saying this, and I'll keep saying it till I drop dead. Africans, are, they don't profess Islam and Christianity because, ah, they saw Jesus. No, over the years, they have found out that that's the only way to access the world. Because they came from the east, they came from the west. So either you profess the Christ, the Western religion or you profess the Christian religion. That's, that's how you get it. So that's why we are they, 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 they present this kind of religious uh, um, Christian Islamic representation. Now, beneath Christianity and religion, all these traditional beliefs take place. Now let me let me tell you this. I used to walk with a, I used I was praying to be a priest, so I used to walk with a Catholic church. 
So what they do is that at the end of each year, they send us to the villages to go and convert people from one religion to another religion. Okay? So of course, to Catholic faith. So I was working in this village. Now, there is this kind of traditional priest. These are people who try to use herbs and rituals, sacrifice the chicken and goats and all that to attend to people's problems. So a lot of this man's house, during the day, you don't see anybody. Eight, nine, ten, the house is crowded. So people are Christians during the day, traditionalists in the night. So that is a mix. So if you are trying to present this, and, and I'm saying this with regards to Christians and also Muslims, okay? Now, because of the force and violence, you identify as a Muslim. You identify as a Christian because of election, because of your dealings with the world, because the world is virtually split between Eastern Muslim and Western Christian Christianity, as the case may be. So, yeah, they, they associate the West with secularism and non-religion, but it doesn't have a lot of force because the money the evangelicals are pushing in in Africa, you guys don't have it. I'm talking about the humans and atheists in, in, in the West. Yes. The evangelicals are pushing a lot of money and using it to push bills like anti-gay bills in Uganda, Nigeria, and all that. So, so you see the West being perceived more as Christian and all that. And a lot of people who want to be in the good book of Western countries or Western institutions, they want to identify. And so, religion is a bit instrumentalist. I don't know. I don't know whether that's the best way to. It's just people, what people are trying to use to achieve a goal. Yes. So. Then, but we know that these people are not religious. Yes, we know. We're living with them. It's just something that you say, okay, a colleague of mine, uh, you know, who are training to be a priest, he's not like the priestly type uh, doing a thing. But, okay, he left. He's into politics. He's trying to become a governor. <clears throat> Some weeks ago, he became a catechist in a local church and came out with a priest and all that. He, has been, he just became too Catholic. He became a very much Catholic now because he's preparing to be a cop. A cop. He wants to be a cop. So that's the thing. So I'm trying to situate it. So statistics will tell you 40% Christians, 40% Muslim or Jeroba. But traditionalists are not there. But those things are mixed. Now, how do they relate? When it comes to these issues, yeah, the, the Christianity does not reach it when it comes to these issues. So if somebody is accused of witchcraft, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim, you really have to, you know very well that you have to really allow the person to be treated how which it should be treated. In Ghana, where I did my field work, the traditional priest who takes care of the accused when they come at the shrine, by one o'clock or two o'clock, you go to the mosque to pray. So you have, you have the shrine at one end of the community, you have the mosque at another end. And of course, the shrine built with um, trees, wooden, and all that, but the mosque built with bricks and built with money they sent from Iran. You see? And there is very comfortable. Then you have fans. You don't have fans in the shrine because it's naturally a very, just like a small bush somewhere. So, where would you want to go and pray if you go there? Will you go into the small bush where you have trees and maybe reptiles and things like that? Or will you go to the mosque that is decorated with fire? People will go to the mosque. If you know, they will believe in what's going on in the shrine. So, and nobody has been able to explain. So when I read this text by, by you know, scholars from here about, I said, look, guys, we are not understanding this thing. They're just misrepresenting it. So what am I trying to say? If you know how to, if you, if you, comrade, if you know how to really categorize these people, who, who go here during the afternoon, the afternoon and go to another place in the night. No, it, it is complex. And that is why this thing has been going on because people, even though they profess Christianity and Islam, they don't actually stop believing in these things and the processes associated with it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have two questions. The first one is, are only women affected of being uh, accused? Um, and if not, what's, uh, what's the, the ratio between accused men and women? And the second question is, the United Nations and other organizations have done radio dramas uh, for educational campaigns that have a very high success rate. 
uh, often used in the health um, uh, context, uh, educating about drinking water or mm -hmm. how not to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Is that a venue that you've been able to use or that you would want to go through? Okay, uh, let me start with the last one. The UN, they have some programs. In fact, they came out with a resolution that should be in 2021 against uh, witchcraft accusation and associated abuses. But do you know what we get? We get that headline, UN resolution against that. After that, nothing happens. After one or two years, um, a conference to look at the protocols. You know, there are all these technologies, which for me, I keep asking them, what is the value? <laughs> now, two or three years will be spent trying to do the protocol and all that. They have one full name. They, they, they say, come to South Africa. We talk, 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 with Esther Code, with him and all that. Some of us who are in a very small organization, we don't have, I don't have one to be traveling. If I go to South Africa, I want to know what, what am I going to come back with to, get to help the victims. I'm not going there to be looking at protocols, adopting protocols. So they take another two, three years to adopt protocols. Then, then you won't hear anything. Again. So for me, UN is just like this redundant organization. I don't know how to say it. Okay? Because sometimes many of these things they don't percolate. You hear them out there. Okay? Good. Some of this drama or some of the things you mentioned are things we need. But we want them lead to lead to as we have seen here. They draw the connection. Like I said, the, the, the UN staff, many of them believe in witchcraft, I've just let you know this. You know, because I was in a, an aircraft with the U.S. staff in, uh, some years ago going to Malawi, and the lady was telling me that there was something like a witchcraft plane. I said, well, there's a witchcraft plane. Why are you in South Africa anyways going to Malawi? Why don't you use it, you said, since you believe there's a witchcraft plane? We got into this kind of argument. Now, are these the people you are going to rely on to deliver this drama? No. So I'm not, you know, I'm not like trying to blame, but I'm also blaming them because we need to get clear in terms of what we want. And when we have this drama, we know what the drama is going to achieve. So, yes, some of these dramas could be, some of these things could be, could be good if they are used to address them. But too often, UN is filled with all these people, people who are being salaried and who do their work and, and they go home. They are not concerned, really, when it comes to this issue. So I think UN need to, they need to change what they do. So I think that that's it. So we need that. We need more of it, but we need them to reflect these challenges as I have uh, as stipulated. Now, more of women, yes. Let me tell you why it's more of women. It's not like men are not suspected. Men are suspected, but enforcement, trying to enforce the label, that's, it. that's the issue, the politics. More of women because women are in weaker social cultural position. Not that men are not suspected. Many men are suspected of being awkwardly evil and powerful and are killing people. But the question is how do you enforce that? That's number one. Number two, there was a particular case in, in when I was in, doing my field work. This man was accused and they banished him. He said he was not going to leave the village. So what they what they kept, they mobilized, the mob kept, mobilized. So all the family members, the wife, the children, everybody, they went and took everything they could get, pistol, to blow everything. So they were like, it, it, it became a kind of scuffle. So police now intervened on the side of the man, and the man stayed. So too often, it's more difficult to banish men. It is easier to banish women, because women are seen like this. So that's why it is there. So that's why when they genderize witchcraft, I told them to critically do that. They don't situate it very well. A lot of men go after those whom they suspect are harming them through a court means by other ways apart from banishment. Yes. And sometimes they could kill them. So there are other mechanisms they use. So by genderizing it, we now don't pay attention to the fact that there is another way of getting at an accused apart from banishing from the community. Because women are you know, usually the ones on that you know, victimized that way. Yes, they are, because they are often, the women are dominant, because they are often those who are victimized when it comes to the extreme, you know, cases of allegations and which ones. Yeah. 
Anything else from anybody? Yes, yeah. That's, yeah. Let me just aside right there. This one. Yeah, it, it is. You know what happens is that we all you, you try to be careful with the security. Even many police officers sometimes they don't go because sometimes they, we have a case we have police they waiting that they shot at them and wounded someone. Yes, because uh, the people doing this sometimes are thugs. You know, all this. Uh, there are many of them are into all this um, hard drug, drug addicts and things like that. And sometimes they use that as a way to spiritually identify who is a witch and all that. So when they have the reflex of drugs. So, so it's dangerous. I just want to say it's dangerous. So what we try to do in each case is that we assess it on case by case basis and see who or how we could. Sometimes people who send the information we don't disclose their identity. So and we try to kill so that we can we could protect them because when they keep doing our work. So it's risky, it's dangerous. But we try to do what we can, using sometimes mechanisms within those areas to minimize the risk some of our advocates or some of us could face. And uh, sometimes when I travel to those places, I go under the road. I don't, I don't show my faces. And when I stay in very in the hotels where I know they could protect me in case I'm attacked. So we, it's dangerous, yeah. But uh, we cannot, they made it dangerous so that we could flee, we could just leave the situation that way. So what we do is that we try to see how we can rally some the police or rally all the people who could help us go after the people and all that. And slowly the risk will just go down drastically because the power equation changes. And the state now goes after those people who are making it dangerous for us. So that's what we try to do. So what's the average education in the areas where this is a big problem? I mean, are kids even going to school at all? Yeah, the, the thing is, in Nigeria now we have, it's not enough to go to school. Yeah, because some of these schools sometimes poorly managed public schools or faith-based schools. Now, faith-based schools is where they also sanctify and sanction witchcraft narratives. Okay, so public schools, many of them not, the teachers are not uh, very well motivated, so it's as good as sometimes not going to any. So a lot of people go to these schools, I can tell you. you know? So it's not like, it, it, more in the south. In the north, the problem we have is that the children are sent to Quranic schools. You know, there's always this ideology that the former schools are Western, and Western Christian. So instead, they should go to Quranic Eastern. So that's why we have the problem we have in Nigeria. So. So what happens is that in the South, many people go to schools, but they are, no, they are not educated. I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it. They go are to they literate? The what? Literate? Literate, yeah. So yeah, yes, yeah. so many of them can, can, they can speak English. Okay? Or read. Yeah. They can read. They can read. They can read and speak, but not very well. It depends on how you see it, you know? Okay. The, the more rural, the less read literate, like that. So in the city, you need certain level of literacy to function, you know, and move around. But as you are moving to the rural areas, less of it, you know, and all that. And then, and then more of anything associated with the traditional life in terms of beliefs and culture and language and all that. So that is it. So the, the literacy rate is low in the villages. And, then, and of course, people, live more according to customs as they perceive it or traditions as they perceive it, unlike in the cities where the state has more presence and they could actually clamp down. You know, and when the chiefs, the local communities, when they are overwhelmed, they could call the police to help them prevail on the map and all that, get some of them arrested. Unlike in the communities where the police uh, posts are very far and all that, and few of them with few police officers can find it difficult to pre prevail over the mob. So that's how uh, the literacy, the literacy rate, how they intersect with uh, these accusations in the rural and urban areas. Well, Leo, thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have handouts up here if anyone would like them that have links to Leo's 
organizations on them and more information about them. Feel free to grab one if you'd like as you're leaving. Um, yeah, any final thoughts you want to leave with us or? Yeah. Any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Okay, well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, coming here has been a pleasure interacting with you. Um, on a speaking tour, I, I have decided to embark on it because I think that um, there isn't a lot of knowledge about what's going on in my own part of the world. And um, it's been going on for years. So I hope that uh, my trip will help uh, inform the humanist atheist community in the U.S. about what's going on, and that we can find a way to work and cooperate better going forward. So thank you for having me. Sure, and you're speaking at American Atheist Convention next yes, week? Yes, this uh, weekend. Yeah, I'll be OK, there. that's in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, yes. Yeah. From there, I'll go to D.C. because uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace, the U.S. Um, Commission for International Religious Freedom, they invited me to also uh, discuss this issue and see how they could uh, support and assist. Then from there, I'll go to Florida, uh, the UU uh, Humanist, Unitarian Universalist group there. Then from there, I'll go to Texas. Um, I'm having this <laughs> meeting with a um, uh, philosopher, yeah. lecturer, because we are trying to introduce critical thinking and philosophy for children. So as I travel, I try to know what is going on there, what are, what are they, how are they doing it here, and from there, I see what I could use to do it. Because what I'm telling you is not just enough to go and bring in police. We also have to find a way to work on the school system and see what we can do you know, to weaken the grip of this superstition you know, with time. So, and I try to put in all this in my trip so that it costs a lot to come around. So when I come, I try to maximize every opportunity I'm meeting. So that's it. OK. All right, thank you, Leo. Yeah. Thank you.